welcome back to episode three, the third and final episode of the Jimmy House podcast. Here with my guest, Matt Scroggin. Would you like to introduce yourself? Matt Scroggin. I've uh, been powerlifting for about 10 years. Um, work at Die Hard Gym as a powerlifting coach and personal trainer. Um, I am a jiu-jitsu practitioner under Tim Welch. Oh, yeah. Um, Blue belt. Blue belt now. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. And for those of you that don't know, Tim Welch is the, he's grappling and striking. Grappling and striking. Coach of Sean O'Malley. Yeah. So the recently former UFC champion, but still one of the best in the world, clearly. Yep. We are here at Art of Recovery in Peoria, Arizona. Phenomenal recovery studio. We got saunas, cold plunges. What else we got over there? Red light, compression, hot tub. tub. Oh, this is perfect. I'm gonna have to come check it out. If you guys are in Peoria, Arizona, come check out Art of Recovery. It's in the same complex as Die Hard Gym, Tim Welch's, Tim Welch, Red Red Hawk Hawk Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and the Recharge Center. So you got a whole sector here of pretty much everything health and wellness that is like within literally the same complex. So it's, it's a really good thing. Now. The thing that I wanted to do for this particular episode is introduce Matt because he and I go back to literally when I was 18 and I first started powerlifting. This is shortly after he started powerlifting. Mm -hmm. And I have to give Matt credit because actually I would say like out of everybody in Arizona, he's probably the person that made me most interested to start powerlifting to begin with. And from that, we went to the same Gold's gym, but at that same time, you're also training out here at Die Hard Gym, beginning right. your powerlifting journey. Right. And I remember the first video, I can recall it to this day, it was, it was you 181, I think it was USPA Nationals, like 2014 maybe 13. or something. 13. 13. And I believe you pulled 562 at 181 yep. or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that, conventional. Yeah. Which at the time was like un- ungodly. Like It's I never, crazy to think yeah. how far yeah. the powerlifting game has come. Because I mean, uh, 567 at 181 at a national level meet these days. I mean, that's not even a last right. warm up for these guys. Right, it's crazy. I mean, it's they're crazy. they're in the sevens and eight hundreds mm-hmm. now. I mean, it's it's unreal how far it's come in. Yeah, seriously, six seven years. But with that said, truly one of the pioneers of Arizona powerlifting, in my opinion, and he's bled that to becoming a phenomenal powerlifting competitor out here. But also, in my opinion, the top coach period when it comes to strength and conditioning, powerlifting, anything else that you're doing with your clients. I've, you. I've recommended as many people as I can your way, especially I before it, yeah. I started coaching myself because awesome. you know when it comes to Matt, he's somebody that started in a similar area that I did in regards to you know powerlifting and, and just being in the same general geographic area. But I noticed from afar very quickly how fast his knowledge gained even faster than the strength that you gained, which was also astronomical, but your knowledge seemed to catch up and surpass that. And it was it was kind of like a matter of time before I was like, okay, he he not only like is getting stronger, but he has a full understanding of why. And he, he's able to re- relay that to his clients. And that's something that early on before I started coaching was something that I had a lot of admiration for. And I, re- I remember the handful of times that I would pop into Die Hard after I started Jiu Jitsu. And it would mostly be just to have the honor to learn from from you mm. and a lot of the lessons that you taught me a handful of years ago are things that I still pass on to my clients now I can you know r- literally recall the lesson that you taught me a handful of years ago and I still say some of these same things and the same verbiage to the clients that I teach now so first off thank you for allowing me to use your knowledge to help my coaching base but I want to talk about that a little bit because you balance powerlifting, you balance coaching, and now you're balancing jujitsu. And it mm. seems as though, similar to what I did a few years back, you went from powerlifting. And before we go into it, do you mind touching on your best numbers so people have an idea? Uh, best numbers, uh, wrapped, so classic raw. Mm-hmm. My best squat was 733. Uh, my best bench press was 429. And my best deadlift was uh, 716. And then Mm -hmm. my best raw, completely raw squat was 660. And then uh, you pulled in the gym, I know you pulled 725 conventional? I pulled 725 for a couple reps. Mm -hmm. I've pulled 765 
straps. Right, yeah, yeah. Gym lifts. It all counts to me, brother. <laughs> that was 800 pound gym. Yeah, squat. I remember that one too. That, that was, was huge, that yeah. was epic right that was here fun. at Die Hard Gym too. So, yeah, he, he's somebody that has reached the pinnacle of strength, and now translating that into jujitsu. We had a similar podcast yesterday, but I'm very curious how you've managed to go through that powerlifting journey and experience all that, but then now be so interested to maintain some of the foundation of what you set for yourself in powerlifting, but now start something entirely new with jujitsu, but still be able to squat heavy, deadlift heavy, bench heavy, and do all these things, pr progress in jujitsu, and then maintain a clientele base, which is, from what I see online, a lot of powerlifters, and mm -hmm. what seems to be now a lot of people in jujitsu sure. wanting to learn how to get strong. Definitely getting more, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's been a long process, because at, at first, I was trying to keep everything at the highest level I could, you know, mm -hmm. trying to lift the same way right. and then throw in jujitsu four or five times a week. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was really running into the dirt and I just couldn't manage it. I was yeah. getting little injuries that were turning into bigger injuries mm -hmm. and then my little injuries were just staying injured. Yeah, right. You know, so uh, it, it's been a huge learning process, um, but it, it's it's balance and, and I think with, with athletes, it's important to understand that everything's temporary, mm -hmm. right? We go through these phases. If I'm getting ready for a jujitsu competition mm -hmm. and my powerlifting stays a little on the back end, that's okay because it's yeah. temporary. You know, we don't have to, we don't have to put all our eggs in one basket and just forget yeah. about everything else. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. Um, so just learning to do that and learning that it's just about phases and, mm -hmm. you know, the powerlifting training really translated over to the competitive jiu-jitsu world um, as far as like peaking. Okay. You know, a yeah. lot of these, I, I, it, from just what I observe, you know, a lot of these guys struggle to peak on the right day mm -hmm. as far as jiu-jitsu. Yeah. And, and a lot of powerlifters, I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong, oh, yeah. you know, that's the biggest thing is being your best on one day, mm -hmm. right? Competition day. Yeah. And I think that's been my biggest carryover from my powerlifting experience is learning to be strong or ready on that day. I like that a lot. And that's something that I think a lot of jujitsu people, especially at the, the entry level, don't really think about. Right. And why would they? Right. But they don't really think about it because you know you don't you know that you should lift, but you don't know how hard or even to progress yourself. So sure. if you're lifting up until the day before the competition, it's all the same because you think you're working hard. But that's where somebody like you is so beneficial, especially to the guys that you have exposure to at Tim's gym because you have the the years, I mean over a decade of experience experience and competing yourself and then also getting other people to compete and peak their strength for powerlifting meets and then on top of that now you're relaying that to people in jiu-jitsu so it's just I had this conversation on a podcast yesterday but you know I think powerlifting you know, if I'm painting a picture of training for people that are doing combat sports, there's a lot of stuff out there on social media as to what's best and yada, yada, yada. You mm. see a lot of really it's silly stuff. It's hard not to get lost. For yeah. sure. And powerlifting to me, I've said this for a long time, to me powerlifting paints a lot of that canvas. I think bodybuilding training paints a lot of that ca canvas. Mobility, calisthenics. Yep. The thing about powerlifting is that you get a lot done with a squat, a bench, a deadlift, and the accessories that follow with that. And I see you kind of apply that same principle with your clients coming from jujitsu. Yeah. How would you say you tweak your powerlifter clients versus your jujitsu clients, but kind of have the same commonalities in, in regards to the goals that they're trying to reach? With the powerlifters, it gets a bit more specific, mm. right? So. You know, if I have a jujitsu guy and we're doing a bench press, we might work up to a top set and that's probably it. Because he doesn't need to be good at bench press. Yeah, right. Right? Yeah. We can get a lot of power output. We can, you know, get a lot of good strength work from the bench press, but we don't need to waste a lot of time mm -hmm. and we don't need to risk the injury. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. Um, especially if, you know, we're trying to build the muscle, we're trying to get them strong, but we're all, we need to keep the catalyst in mind that they need to stay safe. Mm -hmm. Right? If he's in if he's in to see me for supplemental work and we get him hurt, what good did that do? Yeah, right. Right? So um, specificity one. Um, so for the jujitsu guys, I'll just use the bench press, you know. We'll alter it to just a, a safer modality. Yep. Flat dumbbells mm -hmm. or even like a um, 
uh, Cadillac bar, you yeah, know, Kabuki yeah, Cadillac bar. Great, yeah. You know, it, just something to take the pressure off the shoulders, but mm -hmm. still get a lot of good work. Yeah. Right? Um, volume. You know, the volume for the Jiu Jitsu guys, um, especially in the big three, yep. because they're so um, taxing to the central nervous system, doesn't need to be high. Yeah. You know, I can't give a Jiu Jitsu guy 10 sets of squats. Mm -hmm. Right, because he's going to be fried at, at you know, when he rolls later that day. Yeah, the thought of that just sounds terrible. Right, right not now. just his yeah. legs, but you know, his legs might be fine, but mm -hmm. central nervous system, right. you're going to be toasted. Yeah, and that's. Do you mind going into that a little bit? Because that's something too that a lot of jujitsu people that are training in the gym don't have a perception of, which is essential nervous system recovery okay. outside of just the muscle. How, how would you like relay that to somebody that has no idea what you mean by central nervous system? So think of it. Let's let's think of it as local. And, and central nervous system fatigue, okay. right? You do a set of bicep curls, your biceps are gonna be sore, mm -hmm. they're locally fatigued, yep. right? If we're doing a, you know, a deadlift or a squat, something that requires the full body, we're gonna, to our core, be a lot more sore and fatigued. Yeah because of the amount of muscle it takes recruiting to move that weight. Yeah, even uh, like head fog for that matter. Sure, too. Yeah. sure. I mean, it, and, and it just bleeds over to everything. Right. You know, once, you're, once your central nervous system is fatigued, like you said, it's, it's harder to think, you're a little slower, you know, and then it affects your sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you think you're gonna train hard and then maybe sleep really well that day because you've been <laughs> yeah. training hard for three weeks, right. but now your sleep is actually affected. Mm -hmm. So now it's a cycle. So learning those, you know, when to train hard and when to back off. Yeah, I like that a lot. So with all this knowledge that you've gained, you've obviously obviously been mentored by a lot of really intelligent people, a lot of people that have a lot, sure. of, a lot of experience. Sure. Do you mind touching on some of the individuals like throughout your journey that you found have really helped set the foundation for the principles that you kind of stand on now? I know you recently worked with Joe Sullivan and obviously yep. he's like a mastermind in powerlifting. What, what are some of the things you think you gained from the various people that have kind of helped you along the way? So uh, entry, my coach was uh, Tim Sparks, yep. owner of Die Hard Gym. Arizona legend. Arizona legend, yep. uh, powerlifting legend. He, mm -hmm. um, he really taught me how to be gritty and, and how to train really, really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And just say, fuck it, you, yeah. you know? Um, which I think is a very, very important thing. Yeah. And um, missing amongst a lot of the uh, Guys, you know, there's yeah. that spectrum of dudes that just train hard yep. and dudes that just train scientifically, mm -hmm. you know, when it matches, when it meets, 100%. I think that's, that's when it, you know, you get those really impressive guys, 100%. you know, um, yes. and so, you know, I'm so grateful for, for Tim and, you know, everything he taught me, mm -hmm. um, um, allowing me to work for him now, yeah, right. which is awesome. Yeah, and you've been here for um, how long working working there? I've been working there for seven years now. Yeah. And training there for 10 or 12. That's incredible. I met my fiance there. True, Yeah, very true. He yeah. met me there. Yeah. Yeah. I met, I met, he met, yeah, met, yeah. met me at Gold's. But, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, and that's been, you know, it's and it's still a huge part of my life, obviously. Yeah, yeah, um, that's awesome, man. And then, yeah, I got to, I, I got the pleasure to work with Joe. Joe is just, a, a well of information. Yeah, he really I mean, is. the dude is, you told me my information, my, my knowledge game went up. Well, that, I think a lot of that came from being under Joe's tutelage and, you know, um, he really opened my mind to not being so dogmatic mm -hmm. in my training. Yeah. Not to just look at myself as a power lifter so I do squat, bench, deadlift. You know, we were doing, we were doing bike sprints, elliptical nice. stuff, you know what I mean? He, I mean, he really opened my eyes up to being an athlete. That's great. And I think a lot of the, what I learned from him carried over. That's great. To, to now, yeah. you know what I mean? And now um, I use a lot of those same principles in my training and mm -hmm. my programming. You yeah, I, I think that's a great example of a coach that's highly respected and highly successful that is able to humble yourself for lack of a better word to invest in somebody that's as accomplished as a joe sullivan to learn from him to then benefit yourself but also to benefit your clients and i think that's where your clients are so lucky to have you because you're willing to not only humble yourself to have a coach as a coach mm -hmm. but also invest literally speaking into the coach that you're working with so that your clients that are investing into you can right. also benefit it's, it's win it's win 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 yeah, across the board 100 percent. and you know i think sometimes the the thought of some entry-level coaches if we're talking about like beginners in the training field is 
if I work with a coach, does it look like that I don't know what I'm doing sure. or whatever? And does that affect like how? Why do you have a coach? I mean, yeah, Jimmy House. I mean, you're Jimmy House. Why do you have a coach, <laughs> yeah. dude? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, no, and I get it. To be quite honest, like that that is almost the opposite. Sure. You know, if I'm if I'm working, if you're working with a Joe Sullivan, and you're paying him the money to learn from him, like anybody that's working with you should also feel like they're learning from the well that funnels down to. It is trickle. It's, it's, it trickles yeah. down. Right. Sure. And then and soon enough, you're gonna be in the shoes of a Joel Sullivan and there's going to be a Matt Scroggin under you and it just like, it literally just yeah. keeps building and that's yeah, yeah. that's really what should be the point of, of coaching to begin with. I say this all the time but as a coach if you choose to stay with me for the rest of your life, great, I appreciate it. But at the end of the day, by the time somebody leaves me or leaves you, they should just feel confident that they can handle themselves better yes. alone in the gym than when they came in. Because they shouldn't need you. Right. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. you should you should have passed on a good amount of information to where they feel, like you said, confident to keep pursuing what they want to pursue. Yeah, and actually to that point, let's let's talk talk on the business side of things okay. of that because you've been able to sustain this for, as you said, you've been working on Die Hard for seven years. Mm -hmm. This is your full-time job. Yep. That's very, very rare to be able to say for people that are training you, you have some online, correct? Or you Yeah, it's a it's a good split. Okay. So I, I, I do I, I'm I'm at Die Hard for about 10 to 12 hours every day. Got it. Um, you know, eight to 10 of them, personal training. Right. And then I have a, I have a good, um, good list of people uh, like on online. online base. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, and that's kind roster. of like- Roster. Good roster, roster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't think of the word. <laughs> I have a good roster of people that, uh, you know, every, every weekend I, get in contact with them, send them new programs. Great, and, yeah. yeah, and so to that point, and to the prior point, it, it's, any of these clients that work with you, you could work with them for a week, a month, a year, two years, and that's kind of like the nature of the game. Mm -hmm. But what would you say has allowed you as a coach to be able to understand that this is not a forever business for every single client that walks into your hands, but to also like have the confidence to sustain what you've built and understand that your product is so good that you're going to be able to continue to provide to those that want and versus and, and also allow those that need to move on for whatever reason, move on with, with the knowledge that you've given them. How, how do you sustain such a good level of clientele and to where this is your full-time job okay. and n not get lost in the sauce of like nickel and diming and trying to keep everybody right. and, and that's where I think as as a coach I try to advise other coaches and trainers that as easy it is it as it is to get into the mindset of I need this person now and I need them forever like let's make them commit to this three months this six months this nine months I just don't believe in any of it because mm -hmm. I believe in my product and I believe that I will help this person forever long and sure. I know you're the same exact way and you've been doing this longer than I have mm -hmm. so what are the things that you found has really allowed each and every individual that works with you to feel fulfilled and also be able to continue giving that to all the people coming your way? Uh, I think it's just what you said. It's, it's just effort, right? I mean, really putting the effort in and trying to see people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it, it Entry level, it's tough, right? Because you don't have a lot of people, but mm -hmm. as it grows, um, the word of mouth is nice, yeah. but you only get word of mouth if you're putting in the effort to, yes. to, to people. You know, you can't just, you can't just, nice work mm -hmm. as a response to your online mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, the, the in-person is a lot easier, right? Because y you can get to know them, mm -hmm. you can really learn to motivate them and, yeah. and, and, and one, I think that's the biggest thing, it's just building relationships. Yeah. You know, yes, they're my clients, but mm -hmm. um, I care. Yes. You know, to me, getting strong was a really big goal for you, wasn't it? Yeah. You had huge goals. I had huge goals. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to win national championships. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have records. I wanted, right. you know. Yeah. And um, I think it's really important to like honor that for people. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it's a life goal for some people to deadlift 600 pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm going to put in the effort to like really understand them and really see, you know, what can we do to get this person stronger? Right. 
And I think one thing that you're really good at that I think your clients can pick up from the start is you're very empathetic and you can meet anybody at any given level. Sure. I, I've been around where I'm just working out and I can he overhear you with your clients, whether it's a beginner or somebody that's been doing it for a while, you, you are able to meet anyone at any level. And I think that's a huge skill set to have as a coach to where you could work with a top level athlete, but you could also work with like a 12 year old that's never touched a weight before sure. too. And, and that's something where, again, I can't just, I can't give him enough flowers. And if you're in Arizona, please like give this man your money because he is so versatile in your ability to work with people with very, very different goals, but work with like really any personality. Um, and there's sure. a certain level of that patience that comes with that too, because I've, I've had, you know, people might see me train people and, you know, somebody might ha be having a hard time or, or whatever the case may be. And the comments are like, like damn, man, you're, like, you're really patient. I don't think I can do that, whatever. And, and I think that's what helps make me a better coach than what I once was. But to your point, I think you do a very good job on the empathetic side, but also the side of patience to where no one ever feels like they're a burden on your time. And, sure. and that's why, like, again, the skill set, the knowledge I saw great, but then what you do on the emotional side for your clients, that's that's huge. I, I think so too. And I think it, it kind of bridges that gap to where, you know, they do trust me. Mm -hmm. You know, I people aren't really worried about, you know, what I'm asking them to do because right. they know that I'm looking out for their best interests. Yeah. You know, and, and like I, I, you know, I use the, the powerlifting as a, but even if your goal is to lose 20 pounds. Yeah, right. And just feel better about yourself, yeah. you know, let's, let's get that done. Yeah. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, and I think it's 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 finding the the balance of holding people accountable, but also understanding, like you said, where they're coming from. Yeah, you know, and it's sometimes that can be missed, and mm -hmm. it's just you know, get here, get it done. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. One of the things I did want to ask in regards to your transition from powerlifting to jujitsu, I remember when I first started doing jujitsu, which maybe was six years or something like that before you started mm -hmm. but i remember when i first started and you're talking about how you you were thinking about doing it at the time so this long is time, yeah right <laughs> this was something that was on your mind for a while a long time yeah and obviously you were doing powerlifting during that whole time so can you talk a little bit about that transition uh when you were powerlifting and jujitsu was kind of a thought mm -hmm. and and the, all the years it took to finally take that first step and then what what was it that allowed you to take that first step and why ah man that's that's tough <laughs> I, I no seriously. Um, yeah, because you, you're right. I've had an interest in it. I've been following you know your jujitsu career the whole time. Right. Yeah. You know, thank I just, you. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Thank you. Um, I started to make more friends in the world, mm -hmm. you know, and so uh, one of my good friends and and teachers, London Horn. Yep. Yep. He um, he. I, I think I asked him, or I was, you know, I was joking around one day. He's like, "Hey, yeah, if you give me a gi, I'll go over." Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. You know, because Tim moved next right. door, and you know, it was just yeah. a really good opportunity. Seriously. Um, and I would, I would see Tim in the hallway, and he would always, "Hey, you know, come over, mm -hmm. come over, like let's you know, just give it a try, give it yeah. a try." And so that, you know, I think everything just kind of came into fruition, and then um, I just decided one day, you know. And I, I think it was one of those things where at first I was like, oh, this is going to be a side thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to do it for some exercise, yeah, right. a little bit of cardio, yeah. learn some stuff. Because <laughs> yep. again, I just, I wanted to learn. Yeah. I was very, very interested. Uh, my mom wanted me to wrestle in high school, but yeah. I was like, I think I was just too scared, dude. It's because you thought it was sus. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, you know. I think a lot of people are scared yeah, to yeah, try it, and it it's is. and it's. I think it's an ego and pride thing. Mm -hmm, totally, because it gets smashed your first day. Right, and it's and it's interesting because it's like the ego and pride that prevents you from getting there, and then all the struggles you face after the fact with ego and pride while you're in it. It just it sure. never goes away, and it, it's sure. a, it's a tug and pull like at all times. So, what about? while you were thinking about it, what were some of the stuff, or what was some of the, the interference Holding to, me back. Yeah, to hold you back? I think I was re just really deep into my power lifting. Okay. Um, and uh, again, before working with, with Joe, I was mm -hmm. really just singularly minded, you know, and, and just, I can only do this because I'm a power lifter and mm -hmm. seeing myself, as opposed to seeing myself as an athlete and yeah. being able to do this and that in different phases yeah. like we talked about earlier. Yes. You know, um, 
I, I think it was just that. I was scared to get hurt. I was, I was mm -hmm. scared of a lot of different things. Yeah. Fear. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think you make a good point too, because you, you really did transform yourself into an athlete and, and powerlifting is a sport. So anybody that competes in it can be considered for athlete for that given sport. But to be an athlete to me means a lot more and has a much broader spectrum. Sure. And since seeing your transition from powerlifting to jiu-jitsu, not only is your physique changed like drastically, I think your heaviest was 250 maybe? I got up to 260. Two, 260, yeah. okay, yeah. And you're a two, how, how much do you weigh right now? I was 199 this morning. Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 199 and God, God God knows what single digit of body fat you're at. Maybe. Yeah, just it's, I mean, his veins and just his quads is just, I mean, it, it's insane. But the thing is though, from what you were at 260 versus what you are now, you can still do all the things in power lift, maybe not the literal weight, but you can squat perfectly, you can do the deadlift, you can do all these things, and you can do jujitsu. Your cardio has to be through the roof. I'm sure your mobility has probably improved drastically, and you're able to do all, like I've seen your dips, like how, how mobile your shoulders are yep. now, and, and all these different things that I didn't have when I was deep into powerlifting at 270. Sorry to one up you, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but things that, you know, since becoming an athlete for yourself, I've seen like a drastic change Thank overall. You. Yeah, oh, that means a lot. And how does it feel like what talk about ego and pride? How does it feel knowing that your lifts are maybe not literally as much, mm -hmm. but your efficiency and your movement patterns and the way you do these lifts have, have improved drastically on top of like the way you look and feel and I'm sure your overall mindset in your day to day life has also improved. Yeah, I you kind of nailed it. I mean, everything just feels really good, you know, and I think it It's hard for guys to, to, you know, if they want to start losing weight or if they want to maybe change body composition. I think it's really tough, especially for power lifters, because they might not have as much muscle as they think. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Controversial yeah, guys, sure. please don't hurt me. <laughs> seriously, you know, when you start to come down, the shirts don't fill out mm -hmm. quite like they used to. Yeah. Right. You're not quite as big in the chest, the shoulders. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think that really holds a lot of guys back from actually getting better body composition. Right, yes, yeah. You know, and I'm not saying having a bit more on you isn't, isn't, mm -hmm. isn't good, but if, if it's something you're wanting to do and make that change, then you, ego and pride kind of has to go out the window and you have to mm -hmm. understand that things are going to change. Yeah. And to the point of body composition, I mean, it's, it's a, it's an ongoing process. Cause I'm sure when you first lost however many pounds you got to, when you first got lean, you probably looked a little bit less full, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit less back. So you lost literal weight, but the, the veins and, and the muscle bellies weren't nearly as pronounced as sure. what they are now sure. because, and the same for me, like if I'm going on a, a cut that's bigger than 20 pounds, especially in a shorter period of time, I might lose the weight and I'll be able to see that I look leaner, but just naturally because of the calorie deficit, there's probably, you know, somewhat of a deficit of carbohydrates and, and maybe even dehydration to some mm -hmm. degree, depending upon what you're doing, you're just going to look flat. You're not going to look as muscular and to that point that first initial cut if you are trying to improve your body comp composition is is not always going to be your your final form per right. se but it's also necessary to get there i usually find that i look the best after i do that initial cut to drop a lot of body fat then do a maintenance phase to, to essentially fill out again you know get the cars back yep. in you know make the muscles look mm -hmm. big but keep the body fat low and then that second cut where i only have to lose maybe five or ten pounds is when things start right. to get pretty freaky and right. that's where you're at pretty much all the time and I'd have to assume especially with what you post in your stories you're eating pretty pretty good I'm eating pretty good it's 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 awesome because I I I get to have steak mm -hmm. I I really like to cook yeah. I mean you, you see yeah. a lot so it's it's I'm kind of blessed in that way as far as um training goes because all my food's good yeah right you know um and then it, it just learning timing and stuff with my nutrition has been yeah. super helpful um and watching a lot of, uh, just learning, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Learning about the nutrition has really, really taken things off for me. Yeah, and that's huge because I think a lot of people, will end it here, but a lot of people see the way you eat and they see the way you look and they might be like, well, if I ate like that, then I wouldn't be able sure. to look that lean or whatever. But to that, to that point, like it's been a long process to get your, your body weight down to here, your body fat down to here, and then get your body accustomed to eating more and then maintaining this level of body fat. It's maintenance is always going to be easier than getting to that uh -huh. spot. Yeah. Right? And you post, you post the sexy meals, you mm -hmm. post the, the yeah. bone and ribeye with, yeah. your, you know, with your, with your whatever. Right. 
you don't, nobody wants to see the eggs and oatmeal, mm -hmm. the, the chicken and rice that you ate 17 times that week. Yeah. Yeah, very true. And that's like, you know, that, those that's like the foundation for myself right. too. But right. So the next thing I want to talk about with your jujitsu, now that you're obviously deeper into it than maybe you anticipated when starting, you're a blue yeah. belt now. If I'm not mistaken, I don't think you've lost in competition yet. Uh, I went to, so not in the gi. I okay. haven't lost in the gi yet. Okay, yeah, sweet. Yeah. Uh, but in, in, in no, no gi, I've, I, I went to ADCC. Um, oh, you did Phoenix. The, oh, you, nice. Okay. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. I lost both my matches, but I feel like I still had a good strong show. Yeah. And I, I didn't get, you know, outclassed or anything. I just, right. you know, took a couple of L's. And that's huge. <laughs> well, that's huge because like the ADCC, even the opens, like the the level there is just even even with the separation of experience level, the level is just more because sure. especially with those ADCC opens, you have a lot of people traveling to those, so it might right. be ADCC Phoenix, but you you got a bunch of people from California and Vegas. And yeah, I don't think either of my guys were from. Yeah. Arizona. Yeah, so it's really not Arizona or anywhere else you go with those. Sure. So, so, I mean, I, that's a really good opportunity. I'm glad they're doing them out there. That, that's that's cool. Yeah. So, okay, so then with, with that said, with jujitsu being your thing, what are some of the things that you've come to like about it the most? And what are some of the things that you now have set for yourself goal-wise within the jujitsu space? It might be cliche. The people are really cool. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, I know you, you can really understand this too, but the vibe is different than a, Just different. you know, a powerlifting gym or, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, the, the people, um, I like to train and it's been a really good mental battle for me. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said at first, you know, it completely changed the way I saw the world and where I sit in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not that I, you know, you, you've known me before, yeah. you know, no, you I didn't, didn't, I didn't walk around no. with, you know, a big puffed up chest, mm -mm. but man, it, it kind of puts you, gives you an idea of where you're at in the world, man. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as guys, you know, yeah. I don't know, but, um, I think just how much it humbled me and kind of made me look at things a lot differently, mm -hmm. not just in, in jujitsu or athleticism, but just life. You know? Yeah, I like that a lot. With with that said, do you have any particular goals leading uh, in the next coming months or even like long term? Do you? I mean, it doesn't have to be competition wise, but what are some of the things that you want to like try to accomplish like throughout your jiu jitsu career? Jiu -jitsu. Yeah, it's kind of hard to say right now because mm -hmm. I still feel super green. Right. Um, I'm a blue belt, and I um, I've done a couple competitions. I have one tomorrow. Oh, you do? I'm competing oh, you're, tomorrow. oh yeah. I think Fred's is competing in the same. Yeah, one. he is. Sweet, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Very yeah. cool. Um, so I think just doing the competitions and learning, and right now is all I want to do. Great. Just learn and and maybe travel and yeah, kind of see, just keep getting in the door. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a coach at heart. Yeah. So down the road, if if that opened up, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say no. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Because, um, like you said, I, I just like to I like to work with people. I like to help people get them better. Yeah. Um, and I don't see jujitsu as any different than that. Yeah, and I'm sure you probably already helped some of the beginners in there too that were in your shoes not too long ago, sure. as white belts and stuff. You yeah. Know? Um, Live, learn, and pass on. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. You, and with that said, too, you definitely should come out to Austin and check out you know the jujitsu out there. I think uh, you'd dude, love it. That'd be so cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you love it. Yeah. For I sure. think I I think there's a bunch of us that might go out to Austin early next year oh, for dude. a comp. Okay, yeah. Because I think uh, IBJJF has something out there. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think they do like probably twice a year there, it seems yeah. like, something like that. But yeah, yeah, so I think we might come out. Definitely come out, please. Yeah. That'd be great. I'll let oh, you know. Yeah, that'd be awesome. With with the jiu-jitsu, would would, how would you describe your learning in jiu-jitsu versus like your learning in powerlifting do you think it's, it's very similar at the end of the day or do you do you have to approach jiu-jitsu different than you did powerlifting i have to approach it a lot different than okay. than i did powerlifting um as, as, as far as training goes I, I think you just have to be really 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 open to the critiques mm -hmm. you know if you're feeling good and flowing good but you're you know your coach you know, gives you a small detail, detail to think about, you have to be open to it. Yeah. You know, you can't be so stuck in, in how you like to do it or, you know. Um, other than that, I, I, it's not a lot different. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I would agree with that. Because, yeah. because I mean, we get critiqued in, in powerlifting too, you know. But I, for some reason, it was a little different for me um, because I think my body wouldn't move certain yeah. ways. Um, but my one of my other coaches, uh, John Randall, has been awesome with kind of mm -hmm. showing me big man moves. Yeah, cool. You know that that go with what we're doing, but might be a little bit easier for me. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the biggest thing for me was allowing myself to be really, really shitty at mm -hmm. it and, and kind of take those L's all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's a great point because in powerlifting with squat, bench, deadlift, the, the, move, the movement itself just never changes. So we, we have this sure. idea of what it should look like. And, you know, if you have general mobility and are generally athletically competent, you can probably master that pretty pretty quickly. At least, right. like, the general pattern of what it's supposed sure. to look like, you know? Everything breaks down in a certain way. But with jujitsu, even when you start to understand what movements are, and obviously there's a much more moves in jujitsu than there are in powerlifting three versus, like, infinity then once you start to learn what these movements are then it's like there's levels to each movement and how to apply because then you have a resisting opponent versus right. a bar that is always going to be straight with weights on the end and that's not even a knock towards powerlifting per se but it's just with the nature of combat sports in general jiu-jitsu wrestling judo mma you you learn and understand what the moves are to do a takedown to do a submission but then how to set these up versus a resisting opponent that also does all these moves that's when things get super tricky right and powerlifting you're hyper focused on one move you set your brace and you go into the squad and you come up and that's really all your responsibility is but in, in jiu-jitsu if you're hyper focused on one move you're missing so much more and then at the at the same time you're probably leaving yourself open to get attacked on the other end so so there's just so much more to think about so much going on right and that's where i i agree that the mindset with powerlifting and jujitsu there's similarities but it's much more open-minded and right. definitely much less aggressive mm. for sure you can get focused and hyped up for a heavy squat or whatever but that same type of intensity that you might bring into a max out of 10 on depth it's it, just different it, it you might can. not translate it's yeah. not going to translate to another opponent yeah seeing red does not work you no. know <laughs> no and and you know i think people would be surprised how little their seven eight hundred pound deadlift applies to right. combat sports yeah yeah th that's i mean that's huge too you and know people people ask me that all the time like you know in regards to deadlifting and everything how right. much does it actually work how, well, why don't you just throw them over you right yeah you know exactly. you deadlift 800 pounds <laughs> yeah yeah and it's like if an 800 pound deadlifter became gordon ryan then that would be pretty scary right right but gordon ryan doesn't deadlift 800 pounds but he's still gordon ryan right so there's there's a point to where deadlifting i say it like this on on mark bell's podcast i said if if I take a client that deadlifts 50 pounds as a one rep max and we bring it up to 315, you'll probably see some legitimate improvement on the mat simply because they obviously increase their strength right. to, to a degree to where you're at least at a bare minimum of strength in jujitsu, mm -hmm. like a general general strength level. But when it comes to taking 315 to 500, you the, the, the amount of change you see becomes less and less and less. Especially at that elite level. Right. Yeah, I mean, Nick, for example, we got him to deadlift 500 for the first time, and he dominated everybody this year, besides ADCC where he got hurt, but just dominating everybody, and that was well before he got to 500. It was the technique that he had mastered, and then having the strength to deadlift Behind 500, it. It, just, it just, like, right. it just, it's a cherry it on top. It amplifies, right. Yeah. And, and like we said earlier, it's supposed to be supplemental. Mm -hmm. You know, I know the way you train your people and everything, if, if something's not there, we're not going to force it, mm -hmm. right? Especially with, with these guys yeah. who, are, who are there to get stronger, but not at the cost of their jujitsu, of whatever sport they're playing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, it's just, it's such wise words to hear from somebody like yourself because it's, it's a humble reminder to jujitsu people watching is, you know, it doesn't always have to be there. We don't always have to test it. Mm -hmm. And we can take however long we need to to build up to it. And a lot of times, you know, for the athletes I've worked with, like Nick, he take, he competes what seems to be like every month. So a lot of those competition weeks end up just being deload weeks, really. Sure. So there's like a lot of deload weeks happening. Sure. But at the same time, too, if he's consistent long enough, which he has been, you see that long-term sustainable it, progress. It, the, the deload weeks are trending up because mm -hmm. he's getting stronger naturally. Yeah. 
Yeah. Without forcing anything. Yeah, exactly. Some of the last questions that I have, what's really interesting is, you train under Tim Welch, mm -hmm. and he's the coach of Sean O'Malley. Correct. And can you talk about a little bit of what, what that's like to be able to train in the same gym as, as Tim mm -hmm. and Sean and see the come up of Sean and be like a student in that environment? And from what I've seen, it seems like Tim does a really good job of balancing like the glamour side mm -hmm. of, of, of the spotlight and everything from being the sh uh, coach of Sean, but then also being a great coach to the individual students that he works with, the people that are just normal, right. everyday people. It's, I mean, I just want to say thank you to Tim and Red Hawk for everything yeah. they've done for me because it's it's been truly life changing. Um, it's funny because you know you'll you know Tim and Sean will walk up and people will see them and run up to them and <laughs> you know ask for autographs and so they'll do that whole thing. But yeah. like you said, they come in and they're saying hello to every student, That's asking great. them about their day. Yeah, you know That's what cool. I mean. And yeah. they're they're really humble guys. That's really good. You know and. Um, as far as teaching goes, I mean, I've, the way Tim thinks mm -hmm. and kind of breaks things down is, is truly mind blowing to me. That's awesome. The, his, his IQ, um, in, in the fight game is, is unreal. Yeah, I bet. And, yeah. and, um, just listening to him talk and, and do his thing with Sean, mm -hmm. you know, I, trust me, everything I do is from afar with them. Right. You know, I just get to watch and you know, see everything that they do, but it's, it's incredible. That's awesome. Um, uh, Tim in the, in the community has been incredible too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see, we started out, they started out in that one room, yeah. expanded there. And now we have the, um, the Java house too. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Huh? The, the yeah. coffee shop between, yep, and cool. they're, so they're killing it. Yeah. You it know, looks like it. we have a lot of crossover between the gyms, Yeah, you know, so Tim's been nothing but amazing for like the diehard community mm -hmm. and just this community around here. That's awesome, man. Yeah, and, yeah. and they're located also in Peoria, Arizona for yeah. anybody interested. Right next to Diehard Gym. And you guys are predominantly Nogi or, or half and half, would you say? That's tough. Sean, what would you say? I'd say half and half. I'd say half and half. half, and half. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Half and half. Um, That's good. And they do, you know, they do a lot of MMA training out of there too. Mm -hmm. So That's great. Yeah, I, I would say I, I like the balance now moving to Austin of the, of the half and half. You know, like you have the professional athletes that are world-class in Nogi and they do Nogi predominantly most of the time. But I think, I think it's good to have half and half from a class structure perspective so that you can have the option to do both and then you can also appeal to the people that like one or the other. But it's, it's nice because I'll, I'll use Henzo Gracie Austin as an example. You have John Danaher teaching two Nogi classes a day mm -hmm. and then you have Nicholas Marigali teaching all the morning classes of Gi. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's like, so if you're going to Henzo Gracie Austin, it's like you have John in the uh, uh, late morning them, and afternoon, the best minds, right. right? And then you have Nick in the morning, and sure. it just it's. And then there's there's people like Chloe McNally, which is one of the best women black belt in the world, and awesome. and the owners there are also awesome. So it's just, uh, I think it's great to be able to have that so that people can learn. And and to me, when I first started doing jujitsu, even though I I didn't really commit to the gi, I remember some of the er earlier gi classes that I took were instrumental and me just learning what jujitsu is, period. Sure. Yeah. And, and I, I did the opposite. I started in the gi. Okay. And yeah, 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 that's right. You did. And yeah. you didn't really do no gi. Not, not until this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, like if, as a beginner, I think one of the best things you can do for yourself if you're doing jujitsu is do both. 100%. And because the thing is at that early of a stage, mat time is truly just mat time and an arm bar and the gi is respectively basically the same as arm bar and no sure. gi. So before you try to get super specific there, just learn what jujitsu is entirely. That's my personal opinion. I think, and I think it works the best, especially just, you know, you can't always go to no gi class, but if you can go to a gi class, you at least got better at jujitsu that day and it's a great way to approach it. I, I could not agree more. Mm -hmm. I think that's how, cause I do, I mean, I have, I do a class every day. Yeah. You know, one's Nogi, um, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday's Nogi, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday's Gi. Oh, that's cool. Okay. You know, so yeah. it's, you know, I have a good, good, nice balance. As a beginner who has 
you still consider yourself green, but who has done extremely well in the competition scene with no prior grappling experience, somebody that's now at a blue belt level, that's made it out, that's gone through that beginner stage, what are maybe one or two of the more valuable things that you think you could give somebody in your shoes coming in for their first time, also never having done a grappling sport uh -huh. before? What do you think is, is valuable to, to bring into jujitsu? And I'll, I'm gonna kill one for you. Like, obviously leave your ego at the door. We've all heard that. Sure. But what are maybe one or two things that are different than that that you think can be really useful? Just don't limit yourself. You know, yeah. just because you didn't never did it before doesn't mean you can't be good at it mm -hmm. or you can't get good at it. Right. You know, I think that's the big thing is just why have a limit on, you know, how far you can take it. Yeah. You yeah. know, and just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to suck. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're going to suck for a while. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to get beat up a lot. Um, yeah. But, you know, in a good way. And like I said, the first thing I said was the community. The people are awesome. That's great. So, yeah, you're going to get beat up, but they're going to show you how to not get beat up mm -hmm. and, you know, help you out. Yeah, very true. Um, competitively, you know, if, if that's the route, I think it's, I think it just goes back to limiting yourself, you know. I think the people that don't do well don't think they can do well, mm -hmm. you know. And so that translates into their training, into everything else, yeah. you know. So, I think that's a, I think it's just mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I've seen a lot of people that never competed anything before that don't come into jujitsu thinking that they're going to be competing all the time, and then they end up doing a competition for the first time, and a lot of them end up just becoming competitors regardless sure. of age or, sure. or gender or anything. And and so to the point of not limiting yourself, I think that's a great point. And com competing in jujitsu is not a necessity by any means, no. but it's definitely a really cool way to test your skills, get to know more people in the community, and then also just like be genuinely aware of how you can improve. Sure. And for, for again, again, unless you're really at a ADCC level, there's no real reason to come into an event scared, embarrassed, f fearful, it's gonna happen. Sure. But what the most important thing to really realize is that stepping on a competition mat is something that the majority of people on earth will just never do for the case of ego and pride and right. fear and embarrassment and all these things. Right. So just doing that is already a win. Huge and it's, and yeah. it sounds cliche, but if you look at somebody like yourself going from powerlifting where you're like, you're, again, you're just one of the best in Arizona, you're one of the strongest in Arizona, but then to put yourself in a setting where somebody could make you look like one of the weakest in Arizona, sure, right. and you are willing, willing they, to walk plenty into of that. them did. You right, and you, and you willingly go into that. And then you come out of it and you and you do really well and you learn some things and you lose sometimes, you win sometimes and, and you're sitting here all put together all the same and a better person because sure. of it today. I think that's a huge lesson that people can actually learn from your experience. And you talk about people being willing to help beginners in the gym and unfortunately, you know, that isn't across the board, but I would say more often than not, that is the case in most jujitsu schools. Sure. So Bleeding into one of the questions that I've been wanting to ask jujitsu people whenever I have them on is, what are some green flags that you've experienced at your jujitsu gym that other beginners or other people should look for in there? So they don't, my thing is I, I, never, want, I never want people to sell themselves short in their pursuit of pursuing a jujitsu gym. I had a conversation like this the other day where sometimes people pick jujitsu gyms or wrestling schools like it's picking an LA Fitness or a EOS or sure, something like sure. that. And whatever's even, closest. Right, whatever's right, right, closest, right. whatever's most convenient, the right. schedule, these things. And to me, with jujitsu, with, with things that are more than just going to the gym to work out, you, you need to be so much more particular about your selection. Okay. And past that, you need to really, I mean, and you landed up at a great one on your first try, so congratulations. Yeah. But, but a lot of people have to go through a handful of schools after signing a handful of contracts before they find their home. And that's why I always suggest, you know, go to multiple different places, mm -hmm. use the trial classes, and, and get a feel for multiple different vibes. Do your research. See, see who, the, who the teacher is and, and just get a full understanding of what you're walking into, whether you're an adult trying jiu-jitsu and even more specifically, if you're a parent looking to sign your kid up for jiu-jitsu, that's huge. Make sure the person that's leading your kids is a legitimate mentor in life outside of the jiu-jitsu school, period, end of story. So with that said, what are some of the green flags that you've experienced at Red Hawk Academy that you would want other people to look for in other gyms too? Um, man, it, it's kind of tough because like you said, Red Hawk is my only, only experience mm -hmm. I've ever had at a gym. So 
to me, there aren't very many red flags Good. here. Uh, um, it's always a great sign. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I guess like hygiene, right? Yeah. Are they cleaning the mats every night? Are they That's doing huge. stuff like that? Um, be, beyond that, are they respectful? Mm -hmm. Are they respectful to the kids? Are they respectful to the women? Are they, res you know? Yeah. Um, I think those are probably the, the two biggest ones mm -hmm. is, you know, are we clean? Yeah. <laughs> are we respectful? Yep. You know, um, especially for the kids. Yes. And the women. Um, green flags. One more. One more. I guess knowledge mm -hmm. too, right? Really look at and listen to what they're saying. Right. Um, and I guess that can be hard, right? Because what do what do new people know? Mm -hmm. You know, anybody could have taught me anything. Right. I probably would have believed it. Yeah. So that's tough. But maybe just do some research. You know, yeah. if, if you have a black belt or a few at your gym, they're probably going to have some background that mm -hmm. you can you can look at. Yeah. I, I mean, as far as like competition and stuff mm -hmm. goes, you know, mm -hmm. to see if they're actually some legitimate person. Right. And my opinion on that, because he brings up a great point, is if you're looking for a school, and again, this could be anywhere, so you may not have access to a John Danaher right down the road, but if you just have a person that cares about what he's doing, cares about the school, cares about his members, as you said, cares about constantly improving himself, AKA re-evolving himself mm -hmm. as a jujitsu athlete himself, right. that almost in the same conversation as earlier, you getting a coach to be a better coach, is, is your instructor constantly evolving themselves? So they may not be a world champion or they may not be a Gordon Ryan, but to me that's not necessary because that's impossible to exist. Sure. But the good thing about today's landscape, especially with social media and YouTube and instructionals and these different things, you can tell very quickly if your instructor cares about the landscape of the instruction that they're providing, if they're keeping themselves up to date on the knowledge and the, the technique that's proven to work at the highest level. Yeah. Because to yeah. me, why would you not study technique and the, the instructions that are being taught at the highest level that are being proven to work? Why would you not implement that in your day-to-day -day curriculum. If you don't, it just, it, there, that's no excuse whatsoever. So to your point on knowledge, knowledge is subjective and knowledge isn't necessarily saying that this person is a world champion, but knowledge is just basically saying like, does this person care to re-up on his certification as sure. a jiu-jitsu instructor? Sure. And, and that to me alone, and you can find, you know, you can look up a Gordon Ryan instructional, you can, and if you, if you see little things where you're just like, that's a contradiction or like I was told that was wrong or, or this, this and that. Then, then as a student, number one, it's okay to ask questions sure. and it's okay to like be skeptical if you don't feel like the concepts that you're being taught are aligned with the concepts that are being proven mm -hmm. in competition or in MMA or in whatever. So I think you bring up a great point there because knowledge is, is just, it can mean so many things, but yes, make sure that your instructor cares about being knowledgeable about what you're paying him to do. So to bounce off that, Tim, on multiple occasions, has brought in different black belts from mm -hmm. other gyms and allowed them to, to run class That's and kind beautiful. of show, oh, it's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, Italo? Yeah, uh, the Brazilian. I yeah, just, yeah, I just yeah. saw him at Protein House with Victor Hugo yes, uh, Issa, yesterday. You know what I mean? Issa, so yeah. we've, we've had a bunch of these guys come through and Tim just shows Aaron classes. too, right? Aaron, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Aaron, Aaron uh, Wilson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dude, I mean, it's, so these guys are just, um, it, Tim's always bringing people in. So there's another green flag for you is, yeah. is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome to hear that that's such a big, important thing because that's just kind of what he naturally does. That's good. Yeah. And that's huge too. Be, uh, being a coach and being able to be like, Hey, here's a black belt from a school that's next He's door. He's really good at this. Let's hear what he has to yeah. say about it. Yeah. yeah regardless of geographic location, right. regardless of association, just like, Hey, this person knows something. Maybe he knows it better than me. Please, if you don't mind, benefit my students by showing this. That's beautiful. And he's that, humble enough to yeah. do that, and it's it's awesome because he, you know, he's just a student of the game, dude. and mm -hmm. I think that's one of the cool things about working under Tim is like when you see him like engaged in like trying to figure shit out, it's so cool. That's great because he's just so in it, mm -hmm. you know. And he's not much older than I am. I mean, he's maybe two or three years older than me. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. You know, so that, it's yeah. it's it is it's a very cool dynamic because mm -hmm. you know he's in it. He's he's athletic. He's coming back from the uh, the, um, the Achilles the Achilles, right? yep. Achilles rupture. Um, so to see him rolling again and, and to see him doing all that is, is awesome. Dude, and it's great that you mentioned that because I'll compare it to John, John Danaher. So as a beginner, if you're seeing your coach 
not know the answer to something, but try to sit there and figure something out, or even go home, find the answer, and then bring it back to class the next day, that's a huge green right. they're flag. Si they're thinking about that. Right. Yeah, yeah, for huge sure. green flag. Like, it's just impossible to pick one single instructor, maybe unless it's John Danher that just knows everything. Right. But even John Danher to that point, I've seen it countless times where after practice, all, all the people after practice will sit around John, they'll ask questions, and then John will have like, John Carlo, why don't you grab his arm like this and see, and how does that feel? And and he, he's trying to essentially bat, battle test through he's certain, brainstorming. Yeah, he's, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. he doesn't know the yeah doesn't know the answer to something, so he troubleshoots through it. Gordon gives some uh, perspective. John Carlo does. Sure. Luke and is like this collective thing, and John brings himself down to the level of his students to try to hear people like, right to, to try to figure out whatever technique that they're doing for the for the betterment of the room, but also because of his uh, place for the betterment of jujitsu, because so many people use his techniques to better themselves. So you know, I think when you look at the behaviors of top level coaches, such as that with John and such as that with Tim, that's a huge green flag because True. it shows they care. And yeah. at the very, very bottom of it all, having a coach that cares is just truly all you really want to have at the end of the day because accolades and and you know time, a year in the game and lineage, these are all subjective things. But at the end of the day, if you're just under somebody that cares, then you can probably bet that you're at, you're at a pretty solid place for sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah, and that's how it feels, yeah. you know? Um, that's how it looks. It's, from it's, my it's awesome. It, yeah, it's it's. I'm, I'm super grateful. Good. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. Well, to that point, I've been ending my podcast with. It's kind of what my girlfriend does. She does three gratitudes, but I changed okay. it up a little bit. You mentioned the word grateful, so it reminded me. Cool. So mine are one thing that you're proud of, and then two things that you're chasing. Um, I'm proud of where I'm at as a coach right now. Um, and I'm going to use that as I want to become an even better one. I want to mm -hmm. I want to expand that and, and just be the best at, across the board. What do you, you think know? that looks like to you from a chasing perspective? Continuing education. Okay. Always. Right. That's what I meant earlier. Continuing education Continuing for jujitsu coaches. Yeah. White belt, uh, white belt mentality. Mm -hmm. Always. You know what I mean? There is always something to learn. Yep. Jiu-jitsu, training, recovery modalities, nutrition, mm -hmm. you know, it all comes into that. Um, and then, third thing I'm chasing, ooh. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this out there and maybe we can rewatch this next yeah. year. Yeah. But we've been talking, a uh, couple of guys have, and I have been talking about going to um, Masters Worlds in Hell the yeah. E next year. Cool. So I think po do it, getting on the podium at Masters Worlds in 2025 would be I support one this. thing I'm choosing. I support this yeah. 100%. That's <laughs> awesome. And we will 100% do another podcast with Matt because as you can see just from one episode, he's a founder of knowledge. He's a phenomenal human being, a great friend of mine, a mentor to mine. So if you guys don't already, follow him on Instagram. Hit up his coaching services. Anything that this man does, make sure that you're part of it because you will receive value, I promise. Is there any other plugs that you want to mention? Sponsors or just anything that's worth mentioning? Uh, I just want to say thank you to Ardor Recovery for letting yes. us uh, do our thing here mm -hmm. today. Um, Die Hard Gym, they've been nothing but a home and a family to me for a very long time. Red Hawk Academy, Tim Welch, thank you guys for bringing me in and and, and teaching me everything um and then thank you man dude, it's, an honor. dude it, you. it's been it's been it's been insane to watch where you've come since the lunch we had right before you moved yeah i remember, remember that yeah i do um because you did it yeah all, all the stuff we talked about dude i mean it, it it's been insane to see so i just want to say how proud i am of you thank you so much as someone who's just watched the whole thing and just been a fan the whole time i friend, appreciate it's, that it's, yeah thank you it's cool, man. Yeah. There's room for everybody at the top, and it's just to see your friends succeed, it's it's cool. Thank you, man. That's how I feel about you, too. And the lunch that he's referencing is I had um, hit up Matt shortly before I moved to just, like, basically just interview him on, like, how to be a good coach, really. <laughs> yeah, like, sure. from the business side of things to the, the side of actually training athletes. And uh, to that point, again, like, this is somebody that I trust fully. So, again, I just, I can't, I can't give his services and, and him as a person, I can't give him enough compliments because he's just so deserving. So, again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate thank it. You, we'll man. definitely do another episode. Masters World awesome. 2025. You guys stay tuned. We'll Blue put belt. 
Yeah, blue. <laughs> Maybe purple belt by that time. Uh, Art of Recovery, again, thank you guys so much for allowing us to do the podcast here. You guys are a phenomenal recovery studio in Peoria, Arizona. If you guys are interested, please come to their spot and get yourself recovered. Other than that, I appreciate you guys watching. This has been a phenomenal podcast. We hope that you like, share, comment, and subscribe. All the links will be down below. And until next time, Jimmy House, Matt Scroggin, out.